Well, thank you for the introduction and thank, thank you for having me. Um, it's really exciting to, to work with your group, especially with the new Northern Queen initiative. So I'll talk about that a little bit afterwards. And so, yeah, so so with the introduction, um, just a little bit about myself. I probably met a few of you, but not everybody. So um, I grew up in North Dakota, the southwest corner, and I grew up in a large beekeeping operation. My uncle managed around 10,000 colonies. And so I've always been around beekeeping, especially at a large um, commercial level my my entire life. And one one thing I really became interested in was was research, um, not only because, you know, beekeeping is hard, especially doing such a large scale, but I always saw I saw it as sort of a great opportunity because I had this really great connection with beekeepers and I felt like I could use research to kind of help them with their needs, especially after 2006, where, you know, they started experiencing high losses. And one thing I've always been interested in was was bee breeding. And so so even at the time, even as, as a young kid, um, there's been these bee breeding programs you know, the USDA, you know, we were developing the, the Poline stock and maintaining the Russian stock. At Purdue, there's a mite biting stock, hygienic behavior in Minnesota, and then some of the breeding programs at Washington State. There's, you know, there's there's been various ones. But the yeah, but the but the one thing I've I really noticed as of late, there's been kind of a stagnation in, in bee breeding. And as of late, I've seen I, I think there's been more interest by beekeepers in, in bee breeding. And for a long time I really felt like their bee breeding and genetics was really largely ignored. You know, when you think about integrated pest management and management of bees altogether, we kind of forget about bee breeding, even though it can be sort of a sustainable ways to breed for for better bees, whatever your 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 goals are. And so, one thing I really wanted to do was, um, you know, as a postdoc at the USDA ARS in Baton Rouge, was okay. We have this new technology; it's been used by you know other livestock industries, and they made this massive progress. How can we begin to utilize this technology to not only improve our breeding programs, but also integrate this into other beekeeping operations and other uh, queen production initiatives. And so, so today I'll talk a little bit more, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, what are the steps in bee breeding and where are we now? Where do we need to get into the future? And how can we really make those, those incremental steps? And then finally, at the end, I'll talk about genomics and breeding. That's something I'm really interested in. Um, how can we use this new genetic technology, which is getting cheaper and cheaper by the day, it's going to make some of these multi-trade breeding programs more powerful and more accessible and something we can really begin to dive into and integrate into some of these um, queen breeding program initiatives, such as the Northern Queen Initiative in, in Michigan. And so before I begin, you know, this is kind of, a, you know, the beginning talk where we talk about what contributes to colony losses. So, you know, this is kind of a uh, you know the the being slide for most talks, and we always talk about what actually contributes to to colony losses, and you know based on surveys and based on talking to beekeepers one on one, I really think that you know there's really six major drivers of colony losses. There's, you know there's obviously more such as beekeeping management and some other factors, but these are probably the six primary drivers um, of colony losses. You know the first is varroa. We know varroa is a major issue facing beekeepers. Um, we know that if varroa above a certain threshold. You know, they're more likely to crash and die at the end of the season. And so, you know, especially in northern climates, if you have row above, you know, three mites per 100, you know, they're more likely to crash and die. Uh, two of these viruses, and so James talked about these viruses a little bit. You know, there's various viruses associated with colony losses and low colony health. We think about the deformed wing virus, A and B. We think about Israeli paralysis virus and some other viruses. There's actually a new virus that we just detected that seems to be widespread across the United States now. We don't know much about it, um, but it seems like most beekeepers have it. We don't know if it's good or bad, but it's nothing to be concerned about. And these viruses seem to emerge and come out of nowhere. And so this, the, you know, the virus issues is something that we'll have to be dealing with year in, year out because they're ever changing and there's always new viruses emerging. Um, number three are the pathogens. And when, so when I say pathogens, I, I think about, you know, Nosema, which is sort of a gut pathogen. We think about European and American fowl broods. We think about um, you know, some of these other pathogens that are associated with, you know, maybe not necessarily colony losses, but low colony health. And then queen fertility and drone fertility. So one thing that Beakers report is queens are failing, you know, 50% of queens are failing with six months where they should survive, thrive, and reproduce for, you know, two to four years. And so this is a major issue facing beekeepers because if your queen's not high quality, then they're more, more likely to crash and die at the end of the season. And so we're seeing that not only is this sort of a queen issue, but also uh, a drone fertility issues. And then we have land use changes. So, you know, this is sort of a common phenomenon across the United States where, 
you know, these conservation lands or other lands that haven't been, you know, put into row crops are now putting into row crops now. And so we're seeing that there's less forage for bees altogether as, you know, the trend for more bees is, you know, slowly increasing. And so we know if there's less forage area or lower heart, lower quality forage area, then bees are less likely to survive and be lower quality altogether. And then finally, agrochemicals. So it goes kind of hand in hand with the increase of real crops where fungicides, insecticides, a lot of different types of agrochemicals are being applied to these, these real crops. And so when you think about this from a breeding perspective, right, we have these six major drivers of colony losses. How can we use breeding to really produce tolerance or resistance to some of these things, right? So how can we use breeding to produce bees that are tolerant resistant to viruses, tolerant or resistant to varroa pathogens, or produce colonies that have higher queen and drone fertility? Um, I, I think there's a lot of potential, breeding potential for some of these because you know, one, there's already been breeding programs that have really targeted some of these, these things, such as Broa. Um, this includes a pole line stock, the VSH, and then the mite butter behavior stock in Purdue. We know some stocks, like we talked about a little earlier um, in Europe, they've tolerated viruses. Like these, these colonies have extremely high mite levels, but they don't die because the bees are able to tolerate and resist some of these viruses. Um, some stocks produce the pathogens, and then some stocks produce really high quality queens. As for land use changes, agrochemicals, these are more um, based on the you know, policy decisions and informing farmers about the benefits of having pollinators on their land. But when you think about breeding and selection for you know, some of these major drivers of colony losses, I think there's a lot of potential you know, because we've seen it and something that we can really you know, help beekeepers improve on. Okay, so before I begin, you know, I like to talk about you know, what is breeding. You know, Breeding can mean something different to everybody, but breeding basically means, you know, you have you have initial stock and you want to get sort of a trade of interest. And so what you want to do is you want to get, let's say you, you have a trade of interest such as, um, you know, low row levels. What you want to do is you want your the offspring or the, the queens you graft from those colonies, their offspring to have that trade of interest. And so, for example, you know, if you're breeding and selection, you want the offspring of the colonies you're selecting from to have also lower viral levels. And so here's sort of a scheme of, you know, what you'd expect from a breeding for, program for, for generation one. Um, you know, these are four colonies I want to illustrate. And these are the viral infestation levels for these four colonies. Colony one has six mites per 100 bees, two has two mites per 100 bees, uh, seven mites per 100 bees for three, and then one mite per 100 bees um, that, for colony number four. And this is for for you know for generation one. And so what you want to do is you want your 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 offspring or the 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 daughter queens from these colonies to also have lower mite levels. And so by breeding or selecting for you know these colonies with low mite levels, you want the next generation to also have lower mite levels. And so you see by generation two, you know if you are selecting for lower mite levels, and there appears to be some genetic component to these low mite levels, right? Genetics are really important. If these colonies have high mite levels due to the environment, then it doesn't make much of a difference. But, you know, genetics are playing a role whether these colonies have higher VSH behavior, um, higher grooming, they have suppressed mite reproduction, or they produce, you know, more sterile mites, then, you know, you're more likely to select from those and breed improvement of that trait. As you can see by generation two, the, the colonies have overall mite levels, and by generation three, they have mite levels altogether. Now, while this is a very simple simplistic um, illustration, it really shows that, you know, really the goal of breeding is you want a trait of interest and you want to make incremental improvements of that trait over time. And so for ge first generation, mite levels really high. They got lower after generation two and by generation three, they're lower altogether. And so, you know, you know, from a breeding perspective, what we want is we want genetics to play an important role in the trait. And we want to, you know, select and graph from that colony so the next generation has improvement, right? And so that's that's one way I like to to view view breeding. But what 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 do we need to actually start breeding? Now, breeding requires variation, right? If a trait varies, right, there's variation, you know, a trait, whatever you're looking for, then beekeepers can breed from it. And so the the best way I like to really explain this is. You know, all beekeepers see this. You see this every single year. You have two colonies next to each other. 
they're managed exactly the same, but one colony has high mite levels and one has lower mite levels. One has high viral levels, one has lower viral levels. One produces a lot of honey, one produces lower honey, even though the management is exactly the same, maybe they come from the same daughter queens. Now, while the environment can be playing a really important role in that trait, there could be genetics playing an important role that's shaping why this colony is performing better than this colony. And if genetics are playing a really important role in that, that trait of interest, then there's breeding and selection for improvement of that trait. And so while variation can be really frustrating from a beekeeper, if you think about from a breeding and selection perspective, um, it, it offers this, this tremendous opportunity to actually improve that trait. And you know, if I go back to this graphic, for example, you know, if you have operation of these four colonies and you know, these two colonies have extremely high mite levels, but these colonies have low mite levels, then while well, that variation is unfortunate and it, it sucks because these ones may not survive. These low mite levels in these colonies provide a great opportunity to breed and select from this because, you know, if genetics are playing a really important role for why these colonies have low mite levels, then this variation could be really targeted and used to, you know, improve that trait and lower mite levels for the next generation. And so, you know, I want you to think about, you know, which traits you're interested in and, and just kind of visualize how much they vary within your operation and how we can really use that variation in a targeted breeding and selection program. And so really the first thing about breeding is it requires some sort of variation and some sort of variation, in whatever trait you're interested in. Okay, so where, where does variation come from? So first, a, a trait, a trait can be really complex, right? There's different parts that actually influence a trait. And so we can use think of a trait as you know, whatever thing you're interested in, right? every phenotype or trait you're interested in, whether it's honey production, viral levels, viral levels, um, you know, whatever the trait is. And there's really three major factors that influence a trait. First is, you know, genetics. Genetics play a role really in all traits. And the genetics are these genes and gene networks and QTLs that the colonies have that influence whether a colony has a trait or not. And so genetics is the most important part because if genetics are playing a huge role in this trait and why one colony is healthier than the other colony, then that means there's breeding and selection potential for that. The second is beekeeping management. So we all know that beekeeping management varies a lot, whether, whether it's your, your mite treatments, whether you use miticides or non-chemical acaricides or non-chemical mite treatments, or whether it's just based on your, your location, right? Whether you're managing bees in one yard versus the other, right? Be, we know that beekeeping management plays a really important role and interacts with the genetics. And then finally is the external environment, right? We think about seasonal differences. We think about landscape differences, right? Differences in forage. Um, we can think about, you know, year in, year out, the weather can differ, right? Some years there's more rain, some years there's not rain. And so these are the, the external environment. And so what's really important when you think about, you know, why, why one colony may be healthier than the other, we can think about it's influenced by not only the genetics of the colony, the management the beekeepers are applying, but the external environment. But when we want to breed and select, what we want to do is figure out what are the genetics playing a role in that trait. We want to separate the beekeeping management and the external environment. And so I'll talk about that a little bit more because this is a really important concept when you get into statistical breeding, because what statistical breeding does, it basically separates the genetics from the environment and allows you to more accurately select for, for a trait of interest. And so, you know, I just want you to think about this a little bit um, before I get to that point, but just think about a trait as genetics, beekeeping environment, and management, and then external environment. And so for some traits, we've been able to really separate the genetics from the environment and see, okay, um, how much role, what, what role does the genetics play in some of these traits of interest? And so what we do is what we call a heritability score. And a heritability score ranges from zero all the way to one. If a trait has a heritability of one, that means the, genetic play, the genetics are playing the primary role in the trait. That means that the environment plays a zero percent role and the genetics are the major drivers of this trait. An example of this would be eye color. We know that eye color has a heritability of nearly one. And that's because we know that there's certain genes that cause a person to have green eyes, blue eyes, or brown eyes. If a heritability is zero, that means the genetics are playing a, isn't playing a role at all. And the environment, you know, really influence a trait altogether. And so some traits like that, such as flight, like drone flight, for example, has nearly a heritability of zero. Now, for breeding, what we want is a, a heritability of 25. So that means 25% of what we're seeing is due to genetics and not the beekeeping environment or the external environment. 
And if we have a heritability around 25%, that means we can actually breed and select for improvement of that. So for example, viral defense behaviors such as, you know, VSH, suppressed mite reproduction, or, you know, just natural grooming by the, um, the bees has a heritability around 25%. And so that means we can actually select and breed from that. Now, there's, there's clear difference between a heritability of 0.25 versus 0.75, like propolis. Now, if the heritability is really high, like propolis, that means that it's going to be easier to select and see improvements of that trait, right? So rather than, you know, four generations for, for viral defense behaviors, it may take two generations to see high propolis production if you're selecting for that trait. And so that's why it's, it's really important to know the heritability because it, it really informs the beekeeper of, you know, what is the breeding potential for this trait, but actually how fast can you actually see those improvements? So um, now for most traits, so I've outlined, I think I think around 10 or 11 traits right here and the heritability that we know for these traits. And actually most traits have a heritability above 0.25, except for real, ge real jelly production, which is, you know, really low. Um, but but this really means that most traits we can actually breed and select for improvement of these traits, whether you're interested in real defense behaviors or you're interested in aggression or propolis production. Now, the more the, the important thing to note here is that heritability for all these traits is extremely high for, for honeybees. If you look at the heritability for you know similar traits or you know other traits in like, the livestock industry, like the cattle industry or some of these crop industries, the heritability is actually really low. And so because the heritability is high for all these traits in honeybees, it offers a really important and cool opportunity for beekeepers to actually select and improve this trait. And so if you are interested in any of these traits, this basically means that if you want to start a breeding program or if you want to see a breeding program, then you can actually see improvement over time. And so, for example, for livestock industries, the heritability is usually, you know, 10% rather than 25%. And one reason heritability is high for, for honeybees is because one, you know, they have a higher combination rate. So that means that um, bees are basically producing more variation within their genome. And two is their multiple mating. And then three is kind of domestication, right? I mean, domestication can be kind of a tricky term, but for honeybees, it's it's really hard to really domesticate or inbreed bees. I mean, it really, really in a lot of ways. What one one bad thing about honey, I guess one bad thing about honeybees is their genetic diversity is is all actually too high. And so that makes it harder to select for these traits. But because it's so high, that means that it's a high heritability and high potential to actually breed and select for these traits. So you think about livestock industry, one reason they have a low heritability is because, you know, most of them are very inbred. They have low genetic diversity. Um, that, that also helps them select for the trait, but also makes it harder to select for other traits, if that makes sense. And so, but really the big takeaway here is that heritability is very high for a lot of these traits. And so there's tremendous breeding and, breeding and selection potential for beekeepers. Okay, so how do we actually begin integrating this technology, right? How do we breed for better bees, right? We have these concepts in breeding, and, you know, I don't think a lot of beekeepers or, or even researchers really understand the basics of honeybee breeding and, and selection. So how do we begin to really understand these technologies, the limitations and benefits of them, and how do we begin to understand, okay, where do we need to go to actually integrate these into breeding and selection programs? And so one way I really like to visualize it is in, you know, in these breeding steps, right? Breeding step 1.0 to breeding 3.0. And this, this, this way of visualizing kind of tells you, you know, where an industry at is, is at and where it needs to go to really maximize and, you know, make the improvements in a breeding program that you really want. And so, um, so for the honeybee industry, honeybee industry is in what we call um, breeding 1.0 or, or incident of breeding. And so incidental breeding is what we like to call sort of subjective breeding, right? You may quantify a trait, such as doing a mite wash for rural levels or measuring honey production, but it's, it's, it's sort of a subjective measurement because we're not using statistics to um, determine whether this colony you should select from or remove from. So, you know, when I, when I talked about, you know, what makes a trait, right? we have genetics, beekeeping management and environment with incidental breeding, you're basically ignoring the environment and just selecting a trait based on which one performs the best. But there's some biases in place because if we ignore the beekeeping management or we ignore the external environment, then we're ignoring basically half the equation. And so by doing that, you know, we're not going to make the improvements that we really need. And you may not see improvements at all, right? There may just be a stagnation in your breeding and selection program. And so I'll talk a little bit about why how incidental breeding can work, but uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about sort of its major limitations. 
Now, Breen, Breen 2.0 is when we use statistics. And by using statistics, we can actually separate the genetics from the environment. And by separating that, that allows us to really remove those biases that may be influenced by the environment. It allows us more accurately, accurately, you know, choose the colonies that you want in your breeding program for whatever your goals are, right? And so um, a really good example of this is honey production, right? Let's let's see you have two yards. Honey production is largely driven by the environment and what the bees are foraging on. And in one yard, the colony may produce a lot of honey, but it might just produce a lot of honey bees that's in this one location where there's a lot of forage for the bees and it's just you know, the perfect location for bees altogether. But that doesn't mean that's the one you, you want to select from because the environment's probably driving why they call it high honey production. And if you put that same colony in other yards, then it's probably not going to perform as well. And so by using statistics, you can really separate the genetics from the environment and it makes you more, it allows you to more accurately choose which ones to, to graft and choose from. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. I know it's kind of kind of complicated, but it just really removes a lot of these biases. And the three is genomic breeding. So genomic breeding uses a combination of statistical breeding and breeding 2.0, but then we start using genetic technology to select from colonies. Now, what is a major challenge for, you know, measuring traits and breeding? One is measuring traits can be time consuming and expensive, especially if you're selecting for a lot of different traits, right? I mean, it takes a lot of time to measure all the honey, it takes a lot of time to get colonies to to like maximum size to measure row levels and growth rates. It takes a lot of time to measure, you know, drone or queen fertility, right? So it takes a lot of time to measure a lot of these traits and a lot of ways it can be time consuming and something that, you know, if you are running a, a natural bee operation, it's really impossible to do to do both. But with genetic technology, we can basically sequence a colony and predict which colonies are gonna have these traits of interest. And so you can think about sort of a 23 meat test, right? We can do 23 meat tests and you predict whether you are more likely to have this eye color whether you're more likely to be you know, taller, whether you're more likely to have this certain type of cancer. And so we can do that same thing with bees where we can do a genetic test on the colony and predict, okay, this colony is expected to produce more honey than this colony. This colony is expected to have lower referral levels in this colony. And so, you know, it, it just allows us to, you know, with genetic testing being cheaper, it allows us to cheaply measure some of these traits and almost more accurately in sort of certain sort of a lot of ways. And it also allows us to measure hard to measure traits, such as, you know, drone, drone fertility, for example. It's a really hard to measure trait, but by using genetic testing, it might make it easier to, to select for that trait of interest. Now, like I said, the beekeeping industry is still in this breeding 1.0, very in their early stages of breeding, and they haven't really made improvements of that. Whereas every single industry has entered this breeding 3.0, and some have entered actually breeding 4.0, um, which I want to talk about. Um, too much, but most are in this green 3.0, and it's actually amazing to see the type of pro progress they've made in their industry. So, like milk production, for example, in the dairy industry, they've they made just tremendous progress by using genetic testing. And so, really, the goal of this talk is, you know, how can we outline these three breeding goals, and how can we help beekeepers get from breeding 1.0 to this breeding 3.0? Okay, so. First, I'll talk about breeding 1.0, and this is what we call incidental breeding, or um, I guess you can call it subjective breeding. And so for, for, for a lot of beekeepers, this is what they're they're looking for, right? This incidental breeding. And one, one benefit of incidental breeding is it's really fast. It can be fast and easy, especially if you're interested in one or two traits. And so, for example, let's say you're interested in honey production, and this is what a lot of beekeepers do. Um, you know, they have their... 5,000 to 10,000 colonies. And basically they go to each apiary and they mark which ones produce high amounts of honey, medium amounts of honey, and low amounts of honey. It's a real fast way to do it because it's just, it would be too much work to actually measure the honey production for each colony. And so if you're doing this, it's sort of a fast and easy way to, to measure this trait. Um, you'd also add Varroa infestation levels um, you know, for a few of these traits, but even that's more time consuming, especially doing it on a large level. Um, and so this can be a fast and easy way, especially if you're doing this sort of subjective incident of breeding. But the, the major negative is it can be inaccurate and biased, right? Because we're, we're largely ignoring the environment, right? So honey production is a really good example because in one yard, these colonies may perform really well. Base, basically, these are in one yard and they have a really great forage. But in another yard, they may produce less honey just because they're in this, this average or below average yard for foraging wise. And so you know, one yard, this colony may produce a lot of honey, but that doesn't mean it's the best colony to select from, right? Because it's largely driven by the environment. And so, you know, incidental breeding can make progress, but there's also a lot of negatives. And it's really one reason why some of these 
cream producers across the country and some of the eating other breeding programs failed because it can be really inaccurate and biased. And so this is, you know, this is what some large commercial beekeeping operations do. You know, they do produce their own queens, right? I mean, these beekeepers, especially this one and some of these other ones are running 10,000 to 20,000 colonies. And so they already have a massive workload managing this number of colonies. They're focused on the business part of the beekeeping operation. And they're also focused on honey production and then pollination services. And so they have all these other um, things on their plate. And so what they want to do is use incidental breeding to kind of you know, kind of subjectively breed, breed and select for, you know, which colonies they want to want to graph from. And so this is one way that incidental breeding has been implemented in some of these large operations, especially in North Dakota. And so for this one, for example, they have 10,000 colonies and they have them in about, you know, 200, 300 yards. And each yard, their initial screening is, okay, these ones are producing a high amount of honey. These five produce the, the most honey. And so they basically mark those colonies. And so from there, they're able to really, um, really funnel their 10,000 colonies into 400 potential um, colonies to graph from. And then from there, um, they measure some other traits, right? They kind of measure, okay, which ones seem to be more aggressive? Uh, they do viral infestation for, I mean, probably not all 400 colonies, but for some of them, they measure virus levels for some of them because virus levels and virus testing can be really expensive. And then hygienic behavior for some of them, if they have the capacity. And then basically, you know, limit it down to 30 colonies that they'll actually graph from uh, doing queen production service. Now, you, you you can really think about how limited this is. First, there's biases in some of these traits you're selecting from. So you're basically calling out some colonies that could be potential breeders, but, you know, you, you're you ignoring those because it's just too time consuming to really measure those traits, but there's also not statistics available to better select for these traits. And if some of these traits, I mean, you know, you know, it'd be great to measure all these traits on all 10,000 colonies, because you imagine the cost and time it would take to measure honey production for every single colony, the time and cost for aggression, row infestation levels, measuring viruses and hygienic behavior for all of them. It's just, it's just really impractical. And so this, you know, this, I think this breeding scheme has been really successful for, for what they're looking for, but it does have major limitations. And I, and I think one reason why, you know, these operations have seen some improvements for some of these traits, but they haven't seen the improvements that they really want to see. And so they're still seeing the crashes. They're still seeing the high mite levels. And one reason is because, you know, it's not the most powerful breeding program, but but for their type of operation where they're busy doing other things, right? It's just really the best thing to do with what's at hand. And so this is one way, this is one way how incidental breeding has really been worked in practice. And so, you know, I worked with Breeding for Partnership for a couple of years at the University of Minnesota. And then each uh, spring around January and February, we go to California and then also Texas and do hygienic testing. And so if you're not familiar with hygienic testing, what we do is basically a PVC pipe, freeze about 300 cells, and then we come back the next day to see how many of those dead cells um, have been removed or not. And, um, you know, and if most of them have removed like 100%, those ones are highly hygienic. But if, you know, less have removed, like 75% removed, those are less hygienic. And so it's one way we can measure, you know, how hygienic the bees actually are. And so this is what we call incidental breeding because we're selecting basically just 30 potential breeder, breeder about 100 to 30 potential breeders by these queen producers. And then they're kind of choosing based on these hygienic scores. And you can see that for about, I don't know, what do I have here? Five of the 11 beekeepers, you can see this progress over time over, you know, eight year period where hygienic behavior is really low around 50%. But then by year 2018, about eight years later, their hygiene score has got to 75%. But if we're actually doing this in a, a controlled, closed mating breeding program using statistics, these scores should be up to 100% after three years because it's a really easy to select for a trade. And so even though they made progress, it's not the type of progress that they could actually actually could see, right? Like they could see 100%, but they're only seeing up to 75%, for example. And for some beekeepers, they haven't seen progress at all. And so, and, and another thing to note here too, you can see all the variation year in and year out. So I'll kind of focus on beekeeper one. So they've seen a general improvement in the hygienic behavior, but for example, in year three, their hygienic score was, actually year four, the hygienic score is like 78%. But by year 2016, it was down to 70%. And so that's why you see a lot of these fluctuations year in and year out. So 
you know, they're making small improvements, but they're not making the improvements that they ne don't need to see. And so even though incidental breeding can be really powerful because it's cheap, easy, and something that bee beekeepers can use, it, you know, they're not really seeing the progress they really need to make. And this isn't just for hygienic behavior. This can be for all the different traits you're interested in as a beekeeper. Okay, so the first one was, you know, incidental breeding, subjective breeding. And so we've seen that, you know, something that can be easily implemented to beekeeping operations, especially on a large scale, but it does have major flaws and major limitations. The two is statistical breeding. And so statistical breeding has been used. So we talk about a little bit more, but we, we've used at the USC ARS facility for the pole line breeding, for Russian uh, bee breeding, and some other breeding programs, programs are doing it. But outside of us um, and outside of some breeding programs in Europe, statistical breeding really hasn't been used. Even at Purdue, we never use statistical breeding, right? Even some of these other breeding programs, we haven't used st statistical breeding. And so what I want to show is, okay, we're kind of stuck in this breeding 1.0. And I want to show you really how powerful statistical breeding can be and the type of benefits and potential limitations it has. So the the the, the best way I like to really illustrate statistical breeding is you know honey production. I think honey production is a really great example because you know there's these biases in place, right? These beekeeper management in place, there's external environment in place that really influence honey production. And if we're ignoring the environment, we're basically ignoring half the equation. And if you ignore, ignore the half the equation, we're not going to see the improvement in honey production that beekeepers really want to see. And so example here, let's say we have yard one where we have, you know, six, six colonies and their honey production ranges from 40 to 90 pounds. Maybe the average is, you know, 60 to 65 pounds of honey. Yard two, you can see that the honey production is quite a bit higher across these, these six colonies where it ranges from 100 pounds to, you know, 145 pounds. Now, if you're just doing an incidental breeding and you're really ignoring statistics, you may say, okay, this colony produced 145 pounds, it produced the most amount of honey, so we should select from this. But if we actually put this colony into yard one, it may only produce 40 pounds of honey. And so maybe the only reason it's producing this amount of honey is because it's in this yard. But if you put it into you know, yard one or you know, 10 different yards, it may not perform as well. And this is what I mean by these biases in place. You know, as a beekeeper, you say, okay, this one is the best performer, so we should select for this this one. And so we're already biased on our decision. But if we did this, if we move this colony to different yards, it may not perform as well. It, it, it might perform just as well, but it might not. And so that's why it's really important to use statistics, because what we want to do is separate, okay, which ones have the best genetics and which ones the environment's not playing a best role in. And so... You know, this colony, for example, may produce 90 pounds in this yard, but this may have the best genetics. And if you, the offspring from this colony may actually outperform this colony the next year or the year after. And so one benefit is, you know, we, we remove those biases we have as beekeepers. And as everybody, we always have biases. We count for the environment, whether that's beekeeping management or whether that's external environment. We also count for the heritability, Right. So some traits are more heritable than the other ones, such as honey production is has a low heritability versus propolis. And so, you know, if you did propolis, for example, it, would, it wouldn't really matter because propolis would probably be similar for yard one versus yard two, uh, depending where your, your region is. But honey production, heritability is a lot lower. And so, you know, it's not going to, you, you need statistics to really determine which ones are the best performers. Uh, finally, the, the major benefit, I think, is really these multi-trait breeding programs. So let's say you're selecting or you're interested in maybe seven or eight different traits. How do you even begin to choose which colonies to, to graph from, right? I mean, maybe one colony produces a lot of honey, but maybe has higher rural levels and they're more aggressive and they have lower propolis production. I mean, when you're accounting for all these, these seven or eight different traits, how do you even begin to choose those? And so what statistics can do is it can take into account those eight traits of interest, see which ones you're interested in the most versus the least, and say, okay, you should select for this one versus this one. And it really removes the bias out of place. The negatives is it can be more time consuming, especially doing a multi-trade breeding program. And the major challenge is really this technology barrier. So a lot of these other industries have these place, these uh, websites and uh, companies in place that you can send their, your data to them they'll do the statistics and send you back the results. But we don't have that for the beekeeping industry. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm able to do it, but I don't have like a, a site in place or a place for beekeepers to enter data and figure out which ones they want to select for. So, you know, we're, we're getting there, we're developing it, 
um, but we're just not quite there yet. But we'll, we'll, we'll be there in a couple of years. We're developing um, this new site called Queenbase that you can basically enter your data, the traits, and see, okay, what these traits are I'm really interested in. And I'll put a number and tell you, okay, you should graph from this one, but you shouldn't graph from this one. And here, here's an example sort of with the, the output numbers. And so we like to call them breeding values, right? And so a breeding value is basically what is the breeding potential of this colony? And so this is based on the traits you're interested in, but it gives you a value starting at, so a, a zero is an average. So let's say you're evaluating 400 colonies. If a breeding value is a zero for that colony, that means that's the average, right? That's the average of your entire operation. And so you probably don't want to graph from that. There'll be some colonies that have a, a plus number, a positive number, such as plus 10 for this example. And some colonies will have a negative number, such as negative 10. And so negative 10 means that's 10 points below the average. A plus 10 means that's plus 10 points above the average. And so if you're thinking about selecting and grafting from a colony, you want to select the colonies that have sort of a plus 10. And so this makes it easier to really select the colony because it puts a, a physical number next to that colony. And so you can have maybe 400 colonies you're evaluating. You want to choose the ones with the highest positive number and really call out the ones with the, the negative number. Um, and so breeding values can be really powerful in that way. And this is something that the livestock industry and the crop industry has been using since the 70s. And so breeding values have been really powerful because it just really moves the biases in place and allows it, it you know, it, it'll better inform beekeepers which ones to select for. Now, obviously, heritability plays a really important role. And so heritability is lower. Those numbers get really small and close together. So, you know, it's because it's, it's you know, if the heritability is lower, genetics are playing a lower role in that trade and it's be harder to make the improvements. So that's why the numbers are really closer together. Whereas heritability at 0.75, like, Propolis production, you're going to see a wider range of numbers, and that was make it easier to you choose which one you want to select from. Yeah, so, what, so what's, really important, what's really cool about a statistical breeding program is it allows you to, you know, really choose what traits you're interested in, weight them based on your interests, and output a number to select them based on the traits you're interested in and, and their weights. So, for example, let's say you're um, doing a breeding selection program, you're interested in these um, five different traits, honey production, hygienic behavior, lower rural growth rates, high colony growth rates, and low nosema levels. And let's say, you know, this is 100%. You're interested in 40% lower rural infestation levels. You're interested in 20% high colony growth rate, 20% honey production, 50% um, hygiene behavior, and 5% nosema, right? I mean, you, you, you're going to have more or less traits in this, and you weight these differently. But let's just use this as an example. And these are traits you're interested in. Now, if you're thinking about and if you have all these traits in hand for all your colonies, how do you even begin to choose this, right? Especially if you have 40% for this trait and 20% for this trait. What statistics could do, it it really basically out, outputs a number and weights them based on your interest. And so, for example, let's say these four colonies, this colony has a plus five, this colony has a negative three, this colony has a plus 10, and this one's a negative 1.34. And so, you know, it puts a number next to these colonies, say, okay, this one has a plus 10. 10 points above the average. It's the highest one out of these four colonies. And so I should graft on this. And so, yeah, it, it, it really just outputs a, a, a number next to the colony allows you to more accurately select for these colonies and it removes a lot of these biases. And so I think especially for multi-trait breeding programs, this would be really powerful. Now, if you're only interested in like one trait, so at Purdue, we just did mite biting behavior, some VSH breeding program at um, USDA, we're only interested in one trait. It's probably less important to use statistics um, but if you do some multi-trait breeding programs, because beekeepers are interested in many traits, um, this is going to be a really important tool um, really going forward. Now, one example of um, using statistics in a breeding program is the pole line. Pole line stands for pollination line. It's something that we developed at the USDA ARS <clears throat> in Baton Rouge in the late 90s, early 2000s. And, you know, we started with, we, we value about, you know, 1,400 queens, and we eval evaluate them for these, these four different traits, survival, low overall infestation, high colony size, and honey production, right? So we have these four different traits, and we weight these traits based on our interest, right? So we're more interested in lower overall levels. We're also interested in honey production, colony size, and survival. And so we weight this one higher versus some of these other traits, but they're still in our model and allows us to really more accurately select for these, right? Because some colonies may have low row and infestation levels, but lower honey production. And so what we really want is not only low row infestation levels, but high honey production. And so it allows us more accurately choose that. 
And so based on the, you know, 20 years of breeding and selection, we've seen that, um, you know, the polling stock is very similar metrics to the VSH, right? Real sensitive hygiene stock where um, a high percentage of colonies had removal of mite infested brood after one week. They had similar non reproductive mites and higher infertile mites. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can see how powerful the statistic can be used for breeding. And we're only selecting for four traits. So, you know, if you're interested in eight different traits, we can still we can still do that. And so this is really the only breeding program in the US that I know of that's used statistics for breeding and other ones haven't because they've been focused on really on, you know, one trait, such as the Purdue mite biting behavior or the VSH. VSH. But this can be really powerful for a multi-trait breeding program. Okay, so next we get into genomic breeding, and this is this is a, really the final step. This is the step that we want to get to because it can be really powerful technology, and it can use not only statistics but also use gen genetic, to uh, gen genetic technology to select and breed for the traits of interest. So, what is the potential for for, for genetic breeding? So, okay, so I, I'm I'm not sure how many of you have been interested in breeding or have run a breeding and selection program, but what what's a what are the major limitations of a breeding program? One is the long breeding cycle. So let's say you want to evaluate a trade on a colony. You have to invest time, energy to get that colony to, let's say, full maturity, right? Their maximum size where they produce all of their honey. And so that takes about, you know, a full season to get to that point. And at that point, you can measure how high the viral levels got, how much honey they produce. You can measure um, how high these viral levels get, these pathogen levels get. And so... You know, it, it really takes a year to do that. But with genetic testing, we can basically do genetic tests on a four frame nook or do genetic tests on a queen. And we say, okay, these ones are more likely to have high honey production. These queens are expected to produce offspring that has low virus levels, low viral levels, and all together. And so what's really powerful about that approach is instead of waiting a full year to evaluate your colonies, you can evaluate colonies about three to four times per year. And so it's not like, using statistics is a, a lesser method. Genomics is basically allows you to breed and select three to four times a year instead of just once. And so that rapidly increases the breeding cycle and allows you to make that rapid progress you want. Two is, you know, a lot of these traits are difficult um, to measure and select, especially if you're interested in, in many different traits. And so if you're interested in just maybe row infestation or row levels, um, you only select in one trade. My watches are pretty simple. So, you know, you, you, you can do that sort of on a smaller scale. But let's say you're interested in, you know, increased drone fertility. You're interested in honey production. And, and I'll tell you, if you're measuring honey production on hundreds of colonies, it's it's very time consuming and it's really tough. And so genetic testing, it, it can predict some of these difficult to measure traits, such as, l let's say, VSH or honey production or um, rural levels. Um, it's also you know, less time consuming. And so it allows you genetic testing. You can do genetic tests in a colony and get results within a week and tell you, okay, these are the ones you want to graph from. And so in a lot of ways, it's less time consuming because if you're measuring these traits on 400 to 1,000 colonies, that's going to be extremely time consuming and something that you really can't do implement a beekeeping operation. Uh, finally, it can be a lot cheaper because genetic testing is getting a lot cheaper. Um, it, can, it can be a lot cheaper because genetic testing is getting cheaper and cheaper by the day. I mean, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the technology I'm developing right now, but it can be less than five to ten dollars a colony. And so, if you're phenotyping all these colonies, where right, you're maybe hiring more workforce, you're sending samples for virus testing, where right, that can be really expensive. So, if we can predict some of these traits with genetics, it can actually be a lot cheaper in the long run. And finally, it removes these biases, right? We have biases with the environment, and so by using genetics, we can remove some of these biases and more accurately select for some of these traits because. We're basically looking at the genetics and seeing, okay, which ones have the best genetics versus these ones. Now, there's still some unknowns, right? So genetics and many traits are still unknown, and we're still learning more about those. But, um, you know, we're, we're, we're getting there, especially with the cost of sequencing going down. Finally, technology transfers in its early stages. Um, you know, we don't, we're still developing, you know, where should beekeepers send these samples for sequencing, right, for the cheapest sequencing? Um, how do you develop these cheap chips for sequencing? How do we get these maybe technology transfer like the V4 partnership to actually go to these operations and you know help beekeepers select for these? So we're still in the early stages of those, but we're developing kind of the systematic things that we need to do this. And finally, it's really unknown to optimize. So how do we actually begin implementing this to, to help beekeepers? And so I'll talk a little bit more about that. The so the potentials and the unknowns that we know as of right now. 
And so the major benefits of genomics is, you know, the short breeding cycle. And so one thing I mentioned is, you know, for traditional breeding, the one thing you really need to do is get colonies to, to full maturity to actually measure traits of interest. You need colonies to really full maturity in order to measure some of these traits. And so here's a life cycle of honeybees and the roles that are associated with honeybees, right? It, you know, in Michigan, right, it may take you three to four months to get colonies from this colony buildup all the way to colony peak, where you can actually measure how high the grow levels get, how much honey they produce, how fast the colonies grow, and then how high the viral virus levels get. And so it's expensive and time consuming to get colonies to these points to actually measure these traits. And, and so traditional breeding can be really powerful, but, you know, it takes a lot of time and energy to get to this point and only have one cycle per year. Whereas genomic selection and genetic testing, you may see select the colonies early in the season and predict which ones will have high honey production, um, high viral levels, and some of these other traits of interest. And so instead of using a full season for this traditional selection, you can maybe do it three to four times per year. And so that's really the major benefit of genomics, you know, because it's really not to say that these traditional breeding programs haven't been successful because, you know, they, they have been, right? The mite biters have been successful and some of the pole line stocks and Russian bee breeders have been really successful too. It just means that we can make this rapid progress for maybe new and emergent viruses. We can make this progress for maybe AAA laps that, you know, might come here pretty soon. And so we can, you know, instead of wasting four years, we can do it in one year. And so that's really the major benefit of using genetic testing. Uh, finally is, you know, multi-trait breeding programs. So like I mentioned, let's say you're a beekeeper and you're interested in selecting for all these traits, like row defense behaviors, including, you know, grooming behavior, recapping, VSH. Maybe you're interested in low defense behaviors, such as guarding and sting. Maybe you're interested in high foraging in your location, low pathogens, and some of these other traits. Now, it's, it's nearly impossible even for um, research agencies or ac academic institutions to actually select for these traits. But it's even more difficult for a beekeeping operation that has a lot of time and money invested into the business part of it and less time to invest into breeding and selection. And so by genetics, we we know that there we, we know the genetics of a lot of these traits, right? I'd outline the QTLs for these traits. And so we already know the genetics of these traits. And by doing genetic testing, we can see, okay, this colony has this QTL associated with mite biting column, mite biting behavior, and this colony doesn't. And by doing genetic testing, we say, okay, you should select from this one if you want that trait. Or we know a lot about defense behavior. So we do a genetic testing on that colony and say, okay, this one has that marker associated with really aggressive bees, but this one doesn't. So you should select from that. And so it just really allows you to not only select the traits of interest in a, a faster and cheaper option, um, but it allows you to select for multiple traits at, at one point. And so, so just kind of a quick overview of genetics. Um, I'm not sure the um, I, I never know where, where sort of where people stand with genetics and you know their overall background. So I always like to give kind of a little overview of genetics because you know scientists use a lot of different terms, and so I really want to outline what those terms mean. And you know sometimes sometimes they actually use very similar terms. So you know so every single cell of a honeybee has you know DNA. DNA is basically the map or the cookbook for all these different traits. And what's really interesting is actually the the DNA in every single cell is about six feet long. So that's about my height. And so it's extremely long, but it's very small and compact into these chromosomes. And that allows this DNA to be packed in um, every single cell. And so this DNA is made up of all these different um, nucleotides. There's there's four nucleotides, G, C, A, and T. And these are basically the, the genetic map of these traits. And these nucleotides are really termed different things. And so when you hear scientists talk about SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, or SMV, single nucleotide variants, or allele, they basically are referring to these, these nucleotides. And so um, these different nucleotides. And so we think about a SNP, that means that there's variation in one of these nucleotides. So for example, instead of a, a C and G right here, there's an A and T. And by that one single A and T change, that can influence whether um, a colony has that trait or not. And so um, so it's really important to kind of think about these these terms, and you know they're they're, they're very similar, and beekeepers use them kind of um, differently. But you know we, we, when you hear them, it just mean that they're they're exact same thing. Now, like I said, the the DNA is about six feet long, so it's extremely long. Um, but but what happens is they're basically segmented into these kind of small pieces, and so even though you know DNA is you know extremely long, there's different sections of the DNA, and that's what we call genes. 
And genes can have, you know, 10 nucleotides, or they can have hundreds of nucleotides, right? It just kind of depends on the genes. And these different genes have different, a different order of these nucleotides. And these nucleotides, based on their order, are transcribed into, are basically uh, transcribed into these, these proteins, and based on these protein structures, that really makes a trait. And so, for example, these these protein chain these proteins can change based on sort of a mutation. So, for example, let's say you, have, you know gene B and this T and A changes to a gene C. That single mutation, that single change, can change this protein from this kind of weird structure into this structure. And by simply changing that, that can influence whether a colony has a trait or not. And the best example of this is um, hygienic behavior. You know, we know a lot about that. That's a freeze test, and that is a behavior where bees can actually sense whether there's dead brood or not and remove them. And so let's say there's gene A that makes a protein in this structure, and these proteins are expressed in the antenna. And if bees have these proteins in their antenna, that allows them to sense whether there's dead brood inside the cell and actually physically remove them. Now, if there's a mutation right here where this TNA changes to a G and C, and that changes the protein structure of that, that may inhibit the bees' ability to... Uh, measure high, measure dead uh, brood or dead bees at all. And so it's really important to see, you know, how they influence the traits um, and the type of mutations that can influence the trait or not. But by, by knowing which mutations are important and which ones aren't, we can really sense whether they have it or not. And so an example, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how many of you heard my, my drone talk. So I, I looked at drone fertility during my PhD. And one trait I was interested in was, you know, poor sperm quality. You know, why are colonies, some colonies producing drones that produce high quality sperm and other colonies are producing drones with low quality sperm. And I found this one gene called RAS32 that seems to be really important for, for drone sperm quality. And one reason RAS32 um, has issues for some colonies is because of this one mutation. And so this is an entire DNA gene sequence of this RAS32 gene, which is associated with sperm quality. And this, this colony had a T instead of an, an A, and that caused this colony to produce low-quality drones with low-quality sperm. But the colonies that had an A instead of that T had colonies that produced, you know, high-quality sperm. And so it's, it's kind of amazing if you actually visualize like this. Like this is an entire um, gene sequence. There's, you know, hundreds to thousands of these nucleotides, but this one single mutation um, caused this, these colonies to produce really crappy drones. And so we can think about this for, for all these different traits. A lot of these traits have these mutations that cause a colony to have this trait or not have this trait, to have high honey production versus not high honey production. And by identifying which mutations are important, which ones aren't, by identifying these mutations, we can really identify with genetic testing whether a colony is more or less likely to have these traits of interest. And so this is kind of one cool example that I was able to identify. Okay, so there's kind of two major methods for implementing genetic testing into bee breeding operations. One is what we call marker assisted selection. And so this means that we have maybe five to 10 markers that we know are associated with trait. And for hygienic behavior, for example, we know that there's 10 markers and they have a high correlation to high versus low hygienic behavior. Meaning that, for example, high hygienic behavior, the bees are able to remove dead brood, whereas low hygienic behavior, they don't. Um, and so, for marker A, for example, this is gene C in this order, but for marker B, it's actually actually flipped. And by doing genetic testing for these markers, for example, we can predict whether a colony has hygienic behavior or not. And just kind of illustrate how this works. Um, so one thing we did, we, we actually tested this, and this was done in Canada, where we, 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 we basically compared um, the freeze test field assay to genetic testing to see, okay, is this a similar phenotypic selection and similar method? And can we use this as a, a, an alternative, like a cheap alternative to actually field assisted selection? And so this is a percent um, hygienic score where we freeze the cells, come back a day later and see how many were removed. If 100% removed, that means these colonies have high hygienic behavior. If only 25% were removed, that means that, that has low hygienic behavior. Now for the baseline stock, you can see after this is the first generation, this is the third generation, and this is with no selection at all. You can see that the hygienic behavior is practically the same between the two, where it's 75% after the first generation and a little less than 75% after the second generation. This is unsurprising considering um, considering we're selecting for, we're not really selecting for it. These are open mating, and so um, we didn't really expect progress. But for the field assisted assay, FAS, which is the freeze test, 
we see the first generation, the hygienic behavior was around, I don't know, about 70%, 65%. But to three, after three generations, it's nearly 100%, about 95% hygienic behavior. That's what we really expect. But for marker selection, where we're selecting for 10 markers that we know are social hygienic behavior, after three generations, we actually get similar, but also better results than the field of citizen selection. And so by actually just using genetic testing, we can actually select for hygienic behavior without using this expensive and, or I don't want to say expensive, but time-consuming assay. Now, for this type of trade, it's it's something that we can we can select for because we first, we know a lot about it. We know the markers a lot about it. It's been really well studied. And so for this type of trade, it's really easy to, to implement because we do know the 10 markers. But there's, there's definitely a lot of limitations with markers to selection because for a lot of traits, we don't know the exact markers associated with these traits. So VSH, we're, we're getting there, but not, we're not quite there yet. Um, honey production, we kind of know, but not really. But hygienic behavior, this is really possible. And so that's how we get into this sort of method number two, and this is genomic selection. And genomic selection is a new technology and something that I'm developing at the Baton Rouge B-Lab. And it's something that no other industry has, has done yet in, in the beekeeping industry. So other livestock industries have used genomic selection for breeding and selection, but the honeybee industry hasn't, even though it has tremendous potential. And so what genomic selection does is instead of looking at, you know, five to 10 markers that we know are associated with, you know, hygienic behavior, for example, we look at all the markers that honeybees have. And so honeybees have, you know, millions of different markers. And by looking at all those markers, we can more accurately predict whether a colony will have this, you know, this trait or not. And so we look across the entire genome and we see, okay, these 5,000 or 10,000 markers are associated with viruses. These 20,000 markers are associated with low viral levels. And these 10,000 markers are associated with fertility, for example, right? So instead of looking at 10, we're looking at everything. And by looking at everything, we can more accurately predict some of these traits. And it makes it easier to select some of these traits because in, in order to identify one marker, it's very time consuming, it takes a long time. And you do a lot of uh, kind of crosses between low versus high to actually find these, these markers. But by doing this method, it just makes it easier to, to find them. It's actually all, it's also more accurate too. You know, for trade like honey production, for example, there could be 10,000 markers as well as the honey production in one region. But those markers could be totally different for honey production in Florida or California, for example. So it makes us to, I guess, more accurately target genomic breeding to a different region, especially if the environment does play a huge role, you know, like honey production. And so I think I think genomic selection has, you know, tremendous potential and huge potential. And that's something we're, we're developing right now. And eventually we can, you know, implement in the next couple of years. Okay, so, so which markers are associated with better queens? And so we do know markers for some of these traits, but like I said, with genomic selection, we want to find, you know, what are the 5,000, 10,000 markers associated with these traits? And so, you know, one thing, you know, I've been doing this past summer was looking at, you know, I outlined these six traits, high honey production, low virus levels, low defense behavior, low pathogens, and low furrow infestation levels. But I also looked at 20 different traits, including, you know, seven different viruses um, and some other things like that. And we can find, you know, these different, um, you know, markers, these mutations associated with that trait. So for example, these three queens could have Cs and that um, these Cs, for example, these mutations may maybe cause a colony to be more aggressive or produce low amounts of honey, but they have Gs. They may have high honey production, for example. And so what I've been doing is finding, okay, which markers are important and which one are associated with these traits or not. And so um, I actually just got back, I, I, just, I just got back like a, a week ago and I was in North Dakota for for a couple months. And basically, North Dakota is a really great place to, to start this study because one thing about North Dakota is about 900,000 colonies go to North Dakota every single summer and they come from all over the nation. One, North Dakota is this, this common environment. And, you know, most, most North Dakota is very similar to each other. You know, there's some environmental differences based on what, what's grown and the, the type of landscape, but North Coast is very similar. Right? There's not that many blank, plant growings. Second is these queens and open made queens from across the nation are coming from these different areas to North Dakota, right? Some queens are being open made in California, Texas, Mississippi, and Florida, and they have clear genetic differences based on where they're mated. And by bringing them to North Dakota in one common environment, we can try to limit the environment to the best of our ability and see 
how some of these different genetic stocks perform in, in North Dakota and identify, okay, which markers are important and which markers are associated with these traits of interest. And so, like I said, I measured about 25 different traits um, in May and June, and then again in August to see how fast the colonies grew, how fast the mite levels grew, how fast the viral levels grew, how fast these pathogens grew. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I think that's about it. Yeah, so we have about, about 25 different traits. And then I'm in the process of identifying which markers are associated with traits. And then finally, step three is develop like a cheap sort of a SNP chip. So, you know, instead of making doing genetic testing for all million markers, right, can we find 10,000, maybe 50,000 markers that are important for these traits and make a cheap tool that beekeepers can use? And this is what 23andMe test does, right? It doesn't look at your entire genome. It just looks at, you know, about 50,000 markers that are associated with, you know, eye color, height, um, ancestry, certain cancers. So they still develop a cheap chip because it makes it cheaper for them to do this type of test. And so that's basically what we're doing. We're developing this cheap chip, cheap SNP chip that beekeepers can use uh, to do genetic testing. And once it's developed over the next couple of years, we have to evaluate this again. This tool will be maybe 5 to $10 per colony. And so I think it'd be a really cheap, inexpensive tool for beekeepers, but also with a rapid turnaround where if you do genetic testing with this, you can get results within you know a week to two weeks. So you can make the breeding decisions earlier and you can also you know see which one which steps are associated with these traits of interest and here's um kind of an example report that i'm giving to beekeepers so obviously there's the ancestry part of it right what percentage of genes are africanized um and which percentage of genes are have european lineages finally how does um these traits compare to the average and so, for example, this beekeeper, the average deformed wing virus was one, but they had 1.12 um, expression. Um, but they also had higher honey production versus the average, 100 pounds versus 85, uh, more frames of bees, so larger, and then sort of a high quality brood pattern. And so based on based on this, um, you know, they can select for, you know, you know, these nine different traits. But then the coolest thing about this is, and this was I was getting at with the statistical breeding, it puts sort of a number next to that trait. And so just by looking at this and comparing this to 400 colonies, how would you even begin to choose, right? Like which one should I choose from? Which one am I interested in? This would be really difficult to more accurately and unbiasedly choose which traits of interest. But what we're able to do is put um, a statistical value next to this trait. And so, you know, zero would be the average among all the beekeepers are sampled and a a positive number would mean this one has higher breeding potential for all these traits, and a negative number would mean that this one you shouldn't select from. And so by putting a number next to that, it makes it easier for beekeepers and removes some of these biases in place. And so this type of you know, breeding value and generally breeding value is something I really want to utilize in some of these current and future breeding programs. And so you know, how, how do we choose next queen, right? You know, let's say we're comparing, you know, three colonies. One has a plus 20, so that's great. That one's 20 points higher than the average. This one's average, so maybe you don't want to select from that. This one is negative 20. And so, like I said, it puts a number next to it, and it kind of lets you and informs you which colony you, you should potentially breed and select from. And so it gives sort of a simple metric, especially when some of these data can be really kind of hard to interpret. I mean, even for me, it's hard to interpret whether I should choose this colony or not just based on these numbers. But by putting a simple number based on statistics, it'll make it more accurate and easier to choose some of these colonies. Okay, so just kind of overview, right? I talked about some of these breeding steps. And a lot of these industries are really in this breeding 3.0 versus, you know, also 4.0. But for the honey, honeybee industry, we're still in this breeding 1.0, this incidental breeding. And so how can we get from the subjective breeding where there's a lot of bias in place? It can be very powerful, but very limited in a lot of ways to statistical breeding to make more accurate breeding decisions. And then finally to genomic breeding where we can actually begin implementing this, this awesome technology that can, you know, remove the expense can make things less time consuming and you can do multiple breeding cycles per year. And so, you know, how, how do we get from breeding 1.0 to breeding 3.0? And so I've been talking with uh, with James a lot about this new Northern Queen initiative and how I can collaborate a little bit about, you know, the technology I'm developing, the, the type of tools I have in place to help, you know, the Northern Queen initiative kind of reach the goals that they, they want. And so, you know, how, how, how do we begin to start? And so this is really in early stages. And, you know, James can probably talk to you a little bit more about this at a, a, a future date. Um, but but how, how do we start? So the, these are kind of six major steps I kind of view, um, you know, kind of really forming sort of a breeding network and how, 
how once this breeding network is formed, how we get from breeding 1.0 into breeding 2.0, and then eventually into breeding 3.0. And the first step is really outlining the goals. So what is the goals of, you know, this, this breeding network and the queen initiative, right? Are you interested in honey production, low rural levels, um, you know, low aggressive bees? Like what are the actual goals of the breeding network? Two is actually developing the breeding network, right? Who's going to be do the, doing the hardcore breeding? Who's going to be producing the queens? And who are the actual consumers that's, you know, maybe their livelihood or their hobbies dependent on the queens they receive? And so developing this breeding network. Finally, is evaluating using a feedback loop. And so I, th I, th I think the, one, the most powerful thing about some of these breeding networks is, um, so this evaluation feedback loop. And this hasn't really been used, but I think it can be really powerful because it can allow these breeders to make incremental improvements because, you know, if they're breeding, but they're not seeing the output and how they're performing actually in the field, then it's hard to make breeding decisions and evaluations just based on that. And so, you know, work with the breeders and the consumers to have a feedback loop where maybe those high performing colonies based on maybe a queen score or based on the phenotypes can be fed back into the breeding program. I think you can start seeing these incremental changes. Now, once these once the debris network is formed and the evaluation loop is formed, then you can start using statistics. You know, using statistics to um, better make your breeding decisions. And then step number five is to really optimize your breeding scheme, right? So each one's a little bit different. Each one's a little bit different. Um, you know, because your region can be different based on, you know, if you're in an isolated area. So if you're in an isolated area, you may need to use less artificial insemination. Um, you know, your your foraging landscape could be different. You get more beekeepers in your location. So really to work with the Northern Queen Initiative to see how can we optimize the breeding scheme to get the results you want and reach the goals you want. And then finally is genomic breeding decisions. How do we actually begin integrating genomics? And so you can see from here, we start with kind of breeding step 1.0 into breeding 2.0 with statistics, and then finally with uh, genomics. And I'll talk about these a bit more specific. So First, what what are what are the breeding goals? Like, what traits are you interested in? Right? Are you interested in honey production, hygienic behavior, rural infestation, colony growth, nosema? There could be five or six more traits, such as viruses, for example. And then, how do you rank these based on your interests? Right? So, you're interested more in rural levels, like forty percent, honey production, twenty percent, so on. So, kind of identifying the traits and ranking them based on your interests. And so, I, I think it's a really important first step. Two is developing this breeding network, and so these breeding networks can can differ quite a bit. And so first is identify who's gonna be doing the hardcore breeding, um, right? So you have to have, you probably have to have people that depending on your your area to do the inseminations and to actually produce the queens and to conduct the breeding program. Two is the, the queen producers. And so once you have the breeders actually breeding the queens, um, who's actually producing the queens, right? Because if you wanna do this sort of on a large scale, it depends on how many consumers you have, you need people that are actually producing the, the the queens for the consumers, and then finally you have the consumers, right? They're the they're the beekeepers, um, and the operations that are, are are buying the queens, valuing queens, and using the queens within their operation. And so, you know, I get I, I guess you could probably separate and remove the producers, but um, I think I think it's really hard for you know bee breeders to not only do the breeding but also to do the queen production. And so I think it'd be really important to have the queen producers in the middle. And so this is how I sort of envision um, a breeding network. But, you know, this is so early stage. We're still trying to optimize how this should be formed. And then finally, it's sort of a feedback loop. So, you know, if you, once you have this breeding network, how can you evaluate the consumers' colonies, right? Like, how are they actually performing in the state of Michigan, for example, whether that's phenotypically or whether you're doing a genetic testing and seeing, okay, these ones have a plus 20, these ones have a minus 20. So these plus 20s should be loop back into the breeding program. And so how I would sort of envision is the breeders do the breeding, the producers produce the queens, and the consumers are evaluating the queens based on genetic testing. And then the ones that have the highest performers, the ones that have the highest breeding potential, get brought back into the breeding program, and then they're kind of grafted from, from there. And so, you know, I think this feedback loop is really powerful because you can start seeing these incremental, incremental improvements. And, and I really think it's one reason why some of these other breeding programs haven't seen those type of improvements because, you know, you can breed and such with these queens, but you don't really know how they actually perform in these, in these different regions. Okay, then finally statistics. So once we have 
everything set up great, such as the breeding network and the feedback loop. Next is how do we start using statistics for your breeding decisions, right? So ranking the traits of important. And so this can be dependent on, I guess, the board of the, the Northern Queen Initiative or whatever the consumers are interested in and ranking them based on interest. And then from there, you can really um, put a number next to, to the colony. So let's say you have these four colonies. You can have numbers from, you know, plus five, negative three, plus 10, and then, you know, negative 1.34. And so based on this result, you know, if you look at these four colonies, you'd want to, you'd want to select and graft on plus 10 rather than minus three or plus five. And so by having statistics, you can remove those biases and the environments. Yeah, you can start basing it based on these green decisions. And then finally, we get to number five is optimizing green schemes. So this is something we kind of learn as we get more data from the Northern Queen Initiative, right? So how many breeders do you actually need? Like who's doing the breeding? How can you do a mixture between closed and open meat mating? And this really depends on your region. So some areas are more isolated than the other ones. And that's something we'll have to test because if you're more isolated area, you can do more of an open breeding scheme. But if you're not, you may do a mixture of closed mating and open mating. But the question is, how much how much can you do? How much do you need to do um, with open versus closed mating? And then, you know, how many colonies do you plan on evaluating? Finally, which traits? So which traits are important? Some traits may be more important than others. Some traits may be similar, right? So like colony growth rate, honey production probably are really correlated. So instead of measuring, you know, growth rate and honey production, you can probably just measure them once, right? Um, also figure out how to out evaluate them. So you, do you have to actually quantify the trait, such as honey production, or can you just do a subjective measurement, say this one produces the most honey versus this one? And then finally, other considerations to maximize progress. And so you know, once I start working with the Northern Queen Initiative, we can start seeing how do we optimize this breeding scheme based on your region and how do we make it easier for you as a beekeeper. And then finally, uh, genomic breeding decisions. So this genetic test, the SNP chip will be developed in the next couple of years once I get a few more years of data in North Dakota. Um, and then we can see, find which markers are so associated with these traits of interest. And so we've, we've already developed a few of these genetic tests, especially for specific breeding programs. So for the Russian bee breeders, for example, we developed a specific chip that's associated with, you know, what their breeding scheme is. And so once we get further along that line, figure out what goals you guys have and, you know, what, what Northern Queen Initiative wants, we can develop a specific genetic test for your, um, your bee breeding and, I guess, queen production operation targeted to what your goals are. And so... You know, that's something we could we could eventually use to evaluate the colonies and select which colonies you're interested in. OK, so, yeah, this, this is kind of kind of a summary of it. And I'm excited to kind of write a Sarah grant with James about this and, um, you know, use my information and the tools I have in place to help the Northern Queen Initiative kind of get their goal, sort of reach your goals. Right. So, you know, by using this, I use a scheme, I think it's be a big learning experience for me, you know, because I. You know, a lot of this is really th theoretical, but how can we start developing some more of these breeding networks? Because I, because I, I think it'd be really powerful. Um, you know, beekeepers across these different regions want better bees. And so and a lot of them are really interested in sort of a breeding program. But when you only have a few colonies, it's really hard to do that. And so I think by doing this really, this really cool and powerful breeding network, we can bring a lot of beekeepers together and do this breeding scheme that not only allows you to reach your goals, but produce locally adapted stocks to to your region because you know we we can produce and breed bees in you know Hawaii or Louisiana, but they may not perform as well as in your region. And so I think these breed networks can be really powerful. And this is really the first of its kind. And so I'm excited to see how how this goes and how we can use this to use as sort of a model for, for some of these other regions. Yeah, and, and and with that, I hope that was uh, really informative. If you have more specific questions, yeah, yeah, please let me know. You can uh, send me an email. I'm happy to respond. Um, you know, with Northern Queen Initiative, I'm happy to have sort of larger conversations as you guys get further with your your goals altogether. But I I, th I think there's a lot of breeding and pot breeding potential for for a lot of these different traits. And so, you know, I hope this was informative. I, I know it's probably a lot of information, so I'm happy to send the slides if you you know kind of want to go over them again. I'm sure it's I think it's recorded, right? So people can rewatch it, but um, yeah, with that, I'll take any specific questions. Thanks, Garrett. That was awesome. Appreciate it. Appreciate your willingness to be patient with uh, with the little tykes too. <laughs> uh, thanks yeah. for being patient with me. So yeah, sorry about that. He's uh, he's wild. He's sick. oh, and, oh, it's all good, man. You uh, you were an excellent demonstration of patience. <laughs> <I'm> like <laughs> oh, man, I would have been flipping tables by by that time. No, yep. Um, yep. Do what I said. No. 
So we did have a couple of questions pop okay. up while you were while you were speaking, and so I okay. do, I put those off here on a separate document. So I'm going to bring those up. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So the first question came up earlier on in the chat, and that question was, how did someone, how does someone, or how did someone calculate these heritability rates? So like, what's the quick and mm -hmm. dirty on how we kind of came to those heritability rates that you spoke of earlier on? Yeah, yeah, ex excellent question. So what we do is we look at um, the traits in the parents, right? So we look at um, you know the queen, the, the the mother queen, and see if they have honey high honey production, for example. And then we look at their their offspring to see see their honey production. And by looking at basically the inheritance from the mother to the offspring, we can see how heritable that trait actually is. And so there's there's definitely different ways, but that's kind of the quick and dirty way of of measuring it. All right. And then <clears throat> I stepped out just briefly because I had to take care of something real mm -hmm. quick. And there was a question about a virus you had mentioned. So I don't know the context, but it was somebody said, what was the new virus that you mentioned? Yeah, I don't know exactly the name of it. Um, it was just released. I'll, I can I can send the paper after I get done with. Yeah. But yeah, like I mentioned, yeah, there's new virus we just detected in um, really across the United States. And it seems to be pretty prevalent among numerous operations. And actually, OBB just OBB or OBO, OB, OBB or something. Uh, let me. I, I can do. I can do a quick look here, quick. Um, Somebody mentioned it to me earlier today, and I haven't heard about it. Yeah. I think it was I, 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 full, full, full disclosure. I haven't read the whole the whole paper, and so I need to. It was just published like a, I don't know, like a oh. week ago. So, <laughs> um, I, yeah. Once once again, I'll, I'll I'll send it to Chad, and you guys can read it a bit more. Yeah. Cool. All right. While you're doing that. Um, so we got this one. Well, I got that question twice. Do we actually know the QDLs for VSH at this time? Uh, let's see. Um, I think, let's see. Do you still, still see my screen? Uh, you see yes. this, right? Yes. We, we, we do know some QTLs. Um, we don't know all, there's probably more QTLs involved. Let me just see how many were there were, because I think there was like two QTLs we know are involved with that trait. Go back a second. Okay, right here. So let's see, VSH. Yeah, so yeah, so we know two QTLs associated with the VSH. But I, I would say, like, even though we know QTLs associated with some of these traits, these traits are often really complex. And these are only two to be identified, but there's probably at least 15 or 20 more QTLs that are highly involved with that trade. And so we we, we, we do know the, the QTLs, and I think we can predict it with genetics, um, but we still have sort of a long ways to go. And so even though we know that there's two involved, there's probably more involved, um, but these are the two that we've, we've been able to identify. Um, I'm not entirely sure they've been verified yet, but that's kind of where we're at. Um, we're, 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 also, we're, we're also working on um, sort of a gene, genome-wide association study. And so we found that there's, uh, let's see, I think about 2,000 markers associated with VSH. Now, they're not necessarily QTLs, but these markers seem to be associated with VSH. And so that paper is kind of in the, the early stages. And eventually, we we hope to do genetic testing on that. But that may be a couple of years, couple of years down the line. But that's and putting so you in the parking lot at the ballpark. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, the, the data is there. It just needs to the an, analyzation needs to be finished. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, actually, before I go on, the, the the one thing I wanted to talk about QTL versus the markers. I think it can be kind of confusing to to some beekeepers. A QTL is basically a region of the DNA that has you know multiple genes within that region. And so, hygienic behavior, for example, has uh, a QTL with you know five different genes in that QTL. So it's basically just you know, a region where there's multiple genes and that's associated with the trait. And these QTLs usually have a really important role in the traits. And that's why they're easy to identify, but there's also a lot of markers we miss from that that are really hard to identify. And so that's why using this marker assist selection, we can identify, you know, those thousand or 2000 other markers that are important because the QTL isn't everything, right? We need to identify that other markers are important. So I, I hope that makes sense. So let, let, let me know if it didn't. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll probably have to watch it a couple of times myself. Okay. Right? Yeah, 
Uh, so, so yeah, yeah, it helped, it helped kind of clarify it a little bit. It's, okay. it, it's a complex topic, right? And, you know, it is, yeah. you're like looking at it, you've got lab training and, you know, things of that sort. That's important. Um, do certain traits come from the drones in that regard? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's an area that hasn't been well studied, but we do know like a trait, like aggressive behavior seems to be inherited by, the, the the Jones rather than the the Queens, but but even, even aggressive behavior, right? There's there's a lot of different genes and markers associated with that. So some are inherited by the the some are inherited through the drone, and some are inherited through the Queen. You know, majority are inherited through the drone, but still a mixture between between both, right? And so for some some of these other traits, that aggressive behavior is the only one we we do know of that seems to be primarily inherited by the the male. But for these other traits, we we really know less about that. It's just really hard to study, and this hasn't been studied at all. But I'm I'm assuming a percentage of these traits are still inherited by the Jones. We just don't know what percentage. So Matthew Kobe has his hand up. I asked him to unmute a couple of times. I don't know if you can or you go ahead if you got a question, Matt. Yeah. Hey Garrett, I was wanting to know. I have a couple of questions regarding the output of the the SNP data that you showed. So if you go forward a couple of slides. Yep. So the way that you explained it, like negative uh, 10 is you know below the average, positive 10 is above the average. But in that SNP data output, there was a, a numerical value as well as in parentheses, there was another mm -hmm. numerical value that said average. What was that parentheses average uh, compared to the zero average of the trait? No, Does no, good sense? question. Yeah, yeah. So, so these aren't these aren't breeding values, and so these are just basically the the raw values that we we expect, right? So, the average um, from all the colonies would have I don't know deforming virus of one point oh two, but by doing genetic testing, we predict this colony to have a one point one two, so a little bit above average. Now, maybe if I redid this again, I'd probably just do it based on breeding values, where we make these all into breeding values. But these are just kind of the raw values that we expect from these colonies. Right. And so, for example, by doing genetic testing in the colony, we predict this one to have, you know, 100 pounds of honey versus the average of 85, because really the state is dependent on, I guess, like the reference. And so the reference are the colonies I sampled this this past summer. And so the average was 85. We expect this one to have 100 pound average, 100 pounds of honey versus that average of 85, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, these these can be easily transformed into a breeding value where the average would be zero and anything plus would be a benefit, anything minus would be a negative. But yeah, I I I I for, for this bigger, I just made a composite score because they usually want to know like what their levels look like compared to the average. Whereas this one is the actual breeding value, right? The plus 10 and the average is a zero. Does that clarify for you, Matt? All right. Here's a Here's another question. Does the recombination rate in honeybees affect the ability to use MAS? And does that high rate make it more difficult to use? No, that's that's an excellent question. So honeybees have an extremely high recombination rate. I mean, the, the highest except for compared to yeast. And so the high recombination rate makes it easier to um, you know, find these QTLs and markers, but it also makes it harder because these markers are being rearranged pretty constantly. And so it can be really detriment for, for some of these different traits. Now, for some of these traits, right, they can be in these, what we call blocks. And in these blocks, recombination isn't happening in these blocks. And so by looking at the blocks of these markers, these markers aren't being rearranged because they're basically stuck in this block. Um, we can predict that more, more accurately. But, you know, if there's areas where there's a recombination happening, it can, you know, hurt our results. And so what we do is we try to take an account, we take an account that we, we try to find the regions where recombination isn't happening, where it's pretty consistent across populations and just use those markers. Because like you said, if we're using markers where recombination is happening, it can constantly change and change um, generation to generation. So, you know, it just wouldn't be as accurate. And again, MAS stands for marker assisted selection. Exactly. Yep. Yep. M MAS is basically we have, you know, five to ten markers that we know are associated with trade. Genomic selection is using all the markers. All right. I think that covered the questions that came in during the chat. Cool. Let's see here. Yep. 
And then, um, so those for those that were interested in, you know, a little bit more information uh, about the Northern Queen Initiative, the, there's more information forthcoming, obviously, and uh, there will be uh, information on the SBGMI website, uh, and you can look forward to that. And if you're signed up for the newsletter and get our emails, or you frequent one of the Facebook groups, um, that information will also be um, forthcoming there too. So you'll be able to get updates about that and find out how maybe you can participate or benefit from that as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Yeah, if, you're, yeah, if you want to look like a larger conversation, happy to talk to you guys more about this. I know I know it's a lot of information at one time. So um, yeah, happy to collaborate and work with you guys. Daddy. Yeah, I just I just cleared my schedule for the rest of the night so I can kind of like, um, you know, just decompress. <laughs> yep, yep. Lots of positive comments in the in the chat. You know, well done. You did a good job. We appreciate the effort that you put forth in, in, in developing the slides for us and um, making the presentation tonight. And I believe you're actually you're doing a presentation here soon too. coming up. Where are you presenting next? Presenting next. Um... I'm not sure where where did you see that? I, I thought I saw a conference. Maybe oh. it already occurred. It was oh, uh, why? I, I was Washington State. I know we're presenting there in October. Is there and something then, in Canada in September? Hmm. Not 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 that I know of. Okay. <laughs> well, I, maybe I yeah. misread it and I just had Garrett Slater on the brain. Oh, oh maybe maybe I have to look at my schedule. I guess sometimes I forget. <laughs> yep. Don't show up where where you weren't supposed to be, or show up where you were supposed to be a month earlier. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, um, anybody got any uh, last questions, last, any, any burning um, desires to grab him while he's still here? If not, we're going to wrap up. And again, what, thank you so very much, Garrett. We appreciate it and uh, look forward to catching up with you here soon. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And we appreciate your participation, especially those that contributed uh, to putting on this presentation tonight. So Hope your bees are doing well. Hope they haven't overwhelmed you as they've overwhelmed many of us this season. And um, have a great evening. Thanks, Garrett. Thank you, everyone.